Father God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you and we bless you for this time you have given us, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that we can learn your word. And we are so thankful to you, Lord God. Father, we pray that you give us wisdom and understanding to understand your word and live according to that, Lord. Help we submit each one of us unto your loving hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. So when we had our class last, we stopped uh, in uh, John chapter 13, at the end of the chapter, um, around verse 30. So we just have one small portion from chapter 13 to cover. And then from there, we will move into uh, the next few chapters, which deal with the teachings of Jesus. Um, this was Jesus' final hour. You know, the time had come for him to be lifted up. Uh, so the words which he speaks in these chapters must have been very important to him in his heart because, you know, uh, before a person passes on, they would like to give their final instructions. The most pressing things which are there on their heart is what they would like to place before their people. So here in these chapters, Jesus summarizes the things which are uh, most uh, heavy on his heart, things which he really wants his disciples to understand uh, to pick up. So uh, the teachings in these chapters uh, are important. So we will um, cover the small portion which is remaining in chapter 13 and then move on into chapters 14, 15, 16. And we will look at some of the main teachings that Jesus brings to his disciples uh, in these uh, chapters. So to start off with uh, John chapter 13, verse 31 onwards. If we could have someone read out for us, um, maybe from John chapter 13, uh, verse 31. Yeah, maybe up to the end. Yeah, we can go up to the end of the chapter. Verse 31 onwards, up to the end of the chapter, please. So when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. Uh, you will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you a new commandment. I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. But this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, Where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, where can I not follow you? Follow now, follow you now. I will lay down my life for your sake. Jesus answered him, Will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. Yeah, so here we see that you know Jesus is talking about his glorification, how he is going to ascend uh, upon the cross and glorify himself through that. Uh, so he says that before he departs, there is one command that he would like to give them. And it says in verse 34, a new command I give you, love one another. And this is definitely not a new command, right? It's been going on all the way from Exodus chapter 20, where uh, you know, you're told to love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, so um, this is not really, OK, that is not Exodus 20. Uh, but yeah, you know, it's part of the Mosaic covenant. Uh, so we see that this is a very old command. So why does Jesus say, a new command I give you? That word which is used over there, the Greek word, it's not really referring to something which is being spoken about for the first time, as in something new. It's talking about freshness. It is being presented in a fresh way, in a way which it has not been presented before. Okay, So it's not a new commandment. It's a familiar commandment. But now it is being presented afresh 
in a way that it has not been presented before. So what is the freshness over here? Jesus says, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. So yes, all the time from, you know, all the way from Moses times, they knew that they must love one another. But now Jesus is saying, in what way should you love one another? The way I have loved you. That is the standard which I am placing for you. That's the fresh aspect. That's the new aspect that I'm bringing before you, that you must love one another the way I have loved, according to the example which I have set. Because then people will recognize how different you guys are from everyone else. And they will realize, oh, these people must be followers of Jesus. So the way we love one another will set us apart from all the other people and people will recognize that we must be true followers of this Jesus. So when Jesus spoke these words and he said, as I have loved you, so you must love one another, how would the disciples have understood it? They are not yet aware of the cross. Because generally when we, when we read this verse, we immediately think about how Jesus loved us, loved sacrificially. So in the same way, we too should love sacrificially. You know, that's the immediate connection which we make. But at this particular point, when Jesus spoke these words, he has not yet gone to the cross. And uh, these uh, disciples don't seem to be very, very aware of the entire cross event. So what would have come to their mind when he said, as I have loved you, so you must love one another? What memories it, would it have brought back about the three years you know, when Jesus was there with them, interacting with them, what are the various ways in which he demonstrated his love to them? His kindness, his patience, his understanding, his strictness, his correction. They would have um, recollected so many instances of how love was displayed and the example which was set. So he says, in that way, over the three years, the way you have seen me, you know, uh, demonstrating love, that is the way I want you also to love one another, you know, is what he says over here. So um, it's talking about sacrificial love, of course, but then there is so much more, you know, which is being uh, brought out over here. So uh, Simon Peter says, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus says, you will not be able to follow me there because Jesus is talking about death. And um, so Peter says, you know, I'm willing to go wherever you go. I'm willing to follow you. In fact, I'm willing to lay down my life for you is what Peter says. And uh, then Jesus says, you know, you're saying this now, but before the rooster can crow three times, you already would have finished denying me. Uh, so it's basically when the daylight starts coming out uh, that you have the roosters, you know, uh, crying out. Um, now, um, um, so even before it crows three times, Jesus says, you will deny. So over here, we see um, Peter speaking out of his heart, speaking truly when he says, I will lay down my life for you. He's not, you know, bluffing over here. These are not empty words that he's speaking. He genuinely wants to lay down his life for the Lord. Uh, but when that fear and the tension come, you know, in the garden of Gethsemane, when he's ready to take his knife and attack those soldiers. I mean, he doesn't have any training as a swordsman. He would not even know how to fight against soldiers. But that man, you know, valiantly takes out his sword and he's able to at least cut off the ear of one person. So from his side, he does whatever he can to defend the Lord. But the Lord says, put away your sword. This is not the time for swords. So he does not understand at that time and he panics. He thinks, why is the Lord not allowing us to fight? I know at least to go down fighting. So he's not able to understand that. And he doesn't understand why Jesus so willingly allows them to take him away. So in the confusion of all of that, this emotion, you know, this, this, uh, this brave, loyal emotion uh, evaporates. And he, when he's standing over there literally in that courtyard, where uh, you know the court case is going on, the trial against Jesus is going on, he opens his mouth and he denies Jesus three times. So what happened to this man who said, I will lay down my life for you? 
what happened to the man who who actually took out his sword and was willing to fight for jesus what happened um it's because the emotions evaporated so one thing that we learn from this is that the christian walk cannot be lived on emotion alone you know you go on sunday and you listen to a fiery sermon that just gets right into your heart and you think lord i will do anything for you but two days later when nothing is going your way and the lord is not answering your prayers and your fellow believers are behaving so badly um you, you know those those emotions may evaporate so the christian walk is not lived on the power of emotion the christian walk's foundation is not emotion the walk uh, the, the foundation of the christian walk is the finished work of jesus on the cross the only reason we are going to live a victorious christian life honoring him is due to the finished work of the cross because of him we have been cleansed of our sins because of him we have been reborn as new people who can follow his standards so because of the finished work of the cross and because of that grace which he gives us on a daily basis when we approach his throne of grace and say lord i need your help to honor you today so it's on the basis of these two things that we live our christian life emotions come emotions go okay so even if it's something as simple as you know you you wake up really sleepy and tired one morning that itself is enough to um completely you know wash out all your emotional um, highs regarding your resolutions so what really will keep us going is when we go to his throne of grace like it says in hebrews 4 you go to him and say lord i need you i need your grace to get me through this day in a in a way that will honor you so you help me lord you enable me lord give me your grace so through your holy spirit alone i'm going to have a victorious day today and i'm going to be able to do this because of that foundation that work of the cross which you have done so i'm i'm placing my firm belief that because of what you did for me i will be able to live as a new man today i will be able to take off the old and put on the new because you have made it possible for me lord so let us not um try to you know go along based on emotions emotions come emotions go let us base our entire walk on you know prayer where we go to his presence and we say lord i need your grace to be able to handle the situations of this day and i'm coming to you confidently and praying because of the foundation which you laid for me that work which you did on the cross because of that i can stand on that finished wo- work and i can claim in prayer your grace your enabling power and you will help me to live in a way which honors you so let that be the foundation let the work of the cross and the grace and the enabling of the lord let that be our foundation and power not emotions emotions may or may not last so um, with that you know we're moving into chapter 14 uh where jesus talks about uh how he considers them part of his family and is in fact going to prepare a place for them because they are family members uh, so we'll we'll read these beautiful verses so john chapter 14 um maybe we can read the first seven verses john, john chapter 14 1 to 7 let not your heart be troubled you believe in god and believe also in me In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive to receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him. I am the way the truth and the life no one comes to the father expect except through me if you had known me you would have known my father also and from now on you know him and have seen him yes so um here jesus you uh, know um speaks these very familiar words 
uh, he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. And he goes on to say, you know, so I'm talking about going away and you people are very troubled about it. But don't worry, I am going to come back uh, because I'm going to prepare a place for you. And once the place is prepared and ready, I will come back and I will take you to be with me. Okay, so um, he's assuring them that he's not leaving them alone. Um, so in that verse 2, it, say, it says in the NIV, it says, my father's house has many rooms. It doesn't talk about mansions. Um, the um, NKJV, on the other hand, talks about mansions. Uh, the word over there, the Greek word which is used over there, mone, that's basically the word which basic, which, is, which just simply means dwelling place. Okay, so it can refer to a room or it can refer to an independent building. Um, why does NIV use rooms over here? Uh, because they take into account uh, the fact, you know, the culture of that time. Um, because in a Jewish family, every time someone gets married, they don't go away and build a new house. That's basically not how their culture functioned. Um, they would just build extra rooms for the newly wed couple to settle in you know, and have their children and bring up their uh, little family unit. So they were like, uh, like an extended family. You know, they were joint family setups, not like our modern nuclear family setups. So uh, when one of the sons in the family is getting married, his father doesn't go building a new building a new house somewhere else. No, he just adds on extra rooms to the you know building which is already there, and the newly uh, wed uh, couple starts off their life over there. So keeping that in mind, uh, NIV uses the uh, you know the correct translation over here. It says, "My house has many rooms." Uh, so because I mean uh, you know we are gen generally told that because you're a believer. One day you'll go to heaven and you'll have this beautiful golden mansion standing over there for you. And it's all a kind of status thing. Uh, but in heaven, nobody's really going to care much about status and position. Uh, I mean, our priorities are going to be very different over there. So, so nobody's really going to be interested in, you know, in being in a mansion. I think they would rather literally be in Jesus' home with him. Because that's what Jesus is promising over here. Uh, he says... I'm going there to prepare a place for you. You know, you, you guys are family members. So when a family member is coming, you don't put them up somewhere else in a, in a guest house. You bring them to your house and you add extra rooms and they stay there literally in the father's house. So it's a great honor, you know, to literally be in the father's house rather than being in a separate mansion by yourself. And so anyone who goes to heaven, I'm sure would really not be interested in sitting in their own uh, independent mansion somewhere alone out there they would rather be in the father's home because the father literally considers them family members you know so that's the high privilege which is being extended over here to all believers so he says i will come back and take you to be with me so that you also may be where i am so the whole emphasis of going to heaven is not the golden roads or the golden mansions or in fact, even the golden crowns, uh, you know, because here on earth, it's all about gold. But over there, it's about being with him. So he's saying, don't worry, I'm not leaving you. I'm going to come and take you to be with me. So the greatest, the most beautiful thing about heaven is that you will literally be with him. And nothing will ever separate you from him. I mean, that's such a beautiful assurance. So the worst thing about hell is that those who go to hell are cut off from God. I mean, they can have no more contact with him. That is the heights of loneliness and emptiness that a person can experience. Because people who curse God here on the earth, you know, and they say, oh, look at, look at uh, what God is like. You know, he's not blessing me. And he causes people to suffer. He allows hunger in this world. He allows war. What kind of a God is this? And they say all kinds of things against God. But every day they are experiencing his grace, whether they realize it or not. You know, because it talks about the Lord who brings rain upon the evil as well as the good. Every day they're enjoying his benefits. It's when they step into hell and they can no longer feel his grace at all. 
when they have, when there's no covering of his at all left then they will understand what hell actually is complete and total separation from god that is the scariest thing about hell and that's the most beautiful thing about heaven that you will be with jesus and absolutely nothing can ever separate you from him ever and ever forever and ever so that is the beauty of heaven um it's not the golden roads or the golden mansions you know so those are very very insignificant uh, compared to what the lord is offering here he's offering himself and he's saying you literally are part of my family you will literally come and live under my roof as, and i will literally build rooms for you you know using that imagery where he says you know i will make i'll prepare rooms for you uh so we see the closeness that high privilege which has been given to us um yeah so um he goes on to talk about the other advocate that he will send them uh so if we could maybe you know move into verse 15 uh john chapter 14 and if we could uh, maybe read out verses 15 to 17 please if you love me keep my commandments and i will pray that the father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever if uh, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you i will not leave you orphans i will come to you that's the most beautiful thing you know he says i will not leave you as orphans sometimes we will life may get so tough that we feel so alone because even the people who care for us are not able to help us i mean they don't have the power and the influence or the wisdom to know what to do but we have him he is always there so he may not be the physical jesus whom the disciples you know experienced but he has come to us in another form and he says that he is exactly the same that this that this helper this holy spirit who has been sent to us is exactly the same as jesus so the same benefits which the uh, disciples had with the physical jesus we can still have that same level of comfort and encouragement and support it's just that we can't see him and touch him the way they were able to but he says i will give you another advocate and you know you guys being in the third year by now you really must be knowing this verse and all of its you know greek and uh, hebrew and whatever by heart uh, but you know just as a reminder just in case anyone has joined in for this course uh, and has, has not covered it in the previous years now over here when it says another advocate that greek word which is being used over there is the greek word allos there are two greek words for another uh, one word is allos and the other word is heteros both of those words mean another so over here it's talking about the allos advocate an advocate who's exactly like me jesus says who is identical to me and then if you guys were there in the first year when i had used that example in the systematic theology class um you know where you're having two apples and one apple is a shimla apple and the other apple is a i don't remember kashmir apple maybe okay. okay so now those two apples are not allos they are heteros one is of one kind the other is of a different kind here is not you know um, so the, the, the those two apples would be heteros here where jesus says i will give you another advocate he's talking about someone who will be exactly like me so he is using the word allos which means identical so which means both will be shimla apples and over here in you know in, to what jesus is referring to the holy spirit and jesus will be exactly the same so he's saying i'm not leaving you orphans i will be uh, still there it's just that i will be there in the in the form of the holy spirit okay through the holy spirit's work so um we still have uh, jesus with us you know uh, through the holy spirit we have not been orphaned in any way we still have that privilege of having his covering his guidance his power his love uh, we have those privileges even now um and uh, so jesus says in verse 26 
uh, but the advocate the holy spirit whom the father will send in my name will teach you all things and will remind you of everything i have said to you uh, so over here it talks about how this holy spirit who will come uh, he will be sent in my name jesus says what does it mean you see when jesus came he came in the father's name he came representing the father he came uh, representing everything that the father stands for he came to fulfill the will of the father he didn't do anything which would go against the father he was the perfect representative of the father he represented the father correctly in every way he came in the father's name now the holy spirit he says will come in jesus name which means the holy spirit will come as the perfect representative of jesus the same love that jesus had the same compassion that he had the same wisdom which he displayed all of that the holy spirit has and he will you know use that on our behalf to help us to support us to strengthen us to encourage us so the holy spirit comes in the name of jesus accurately representing jesus in every way so he he will be there for us in the same way that jesus was there for those disciples and therefore jesus says peace i leave with you my peace i give you i do not give to you as the world gives therefore you know he says do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid what kind of a peace does the world give if they are able to get rid of war and violence if they are able to you know make you financially secure if they are able to arrange certain circumstances for you then they, the world can guarantee you peace if you take away those things the peace is gone but jesus says the peace which i give you through my holy spirit no matter what your circumstances are you can still hold on because he will come through for you so that is the peace which we have you know which is why it says in philippians 4 rejoice in the lord again i say rejoice it does it is not talking about going around everywhere with a big grin on your face all the time even jesus never went around all the time grinning you know he express the appropriate emotions on the appropriate occasions the attitude of rejoicing and peace which is being talked about is that deep assurance that god is there for me he will come through no matter what uh, and now that the holy spirit has been given to us as allos the same kind of advocate that jesus was we can have that assurance that he will always be there so this is a far greater peace so the world will look at you and say my goodness your world your home is turning upside down why are you not upset you can say i am at peace because i have our lord to advocate the same type of helper that jesus was i have that helper with me still i have not been orphaned so it is that attitude of rejoicing it is that peace which is talked about over here the world is not able to give you that Uh, that kind of a peace once the good circumstances are gone the peace also goes when it comes to worldly peace but his peace is there you know yesterday's sermon was about the zoe life pastor nancy was preaching about that so that zoe life is lived out through faith where you hold on to him because he is that helper who will never let go he'll always be there so therefore we don't have to forego our peace we can be assured that he will come through in his time in his way and if we you know we are too deaf to hear what he's saying he will open our ears you know you just have to say lord i'm not able to hear from you regarding this particular thing what do i do how do i handle it you know lord my ears are too deaf open my ears lord heal my ears i want to hear from your word what you're saying about this situation what do i do how do i handle it and the lord who loves you will open your ears and help you to hear the guidance which he is giving so we can have this deep assurance that we are never alone he is always there for us so um you know with that thought uh, maybe we can move into john chapter 15 um yeah um, yeah because we need to get all the way up to uh, chapter 16 so we're just looking at the main teachings the highlights 
you know, so uh, John chapter 15, um, if maybe we could begin by reading out uh, the first seven verses. Yeah, John 15 verses 1 to 7, please. John chapter 15. I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit, for it is served from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the wine. You are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and with us. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and I will and it will be granted. Yeah. So Jesus says, I am the true wine. Does that mean there is also something called a false wine? Why does it say that, you know, so that's the point being made over here. Um, in the time of Herod, um, you know, uh, when, the, when that grand temple was still in existence, um, they say that the gateway, the entrance way had this um, uh, border around it, it, it seems. Uh, a, a golden creeper, literally made of gold. So they had this gold, uh, golden wine creeper, which formed like a frame, uh, a kind of um, uh, uh, border all around the gateway. Of course, you know, once the Romans came and they de they destroyed the temple, all of that was taken away. Uh, so that wine, that grape wine, was supposed to represent Israel. Because Israel was supposed to be a grape wine, bearing much fruit, being a blessing to all the nations around it. That is what God originally planned and purposed for them. But they proved to be a very fake and false wine. Um, so let's look at Psalm 80, verses 8 and 9, if someone could read out. That is where the imagery of uh, Israel as a wine is brought out. Um, Psalm 80, Psalm 80, verses 8 and 9. Psalm chapter 80, verse 8 and 9. You brought us from Egypt like a grapevine. You drew away the pagan nations and transplanted us into your land. You cleared the ground for us and we took root and filled the land. Exactly. He drives out the locals you know, from the land of Canaan and he plants this grapevine over there and they prosper they take root and they fill the land so they were supposed to be this wonderful luscious grapevine which is bringing out much fruit and being a great blessing to everyone but as time goes by this grapevine turns out to be very hypocritical and so in isaiah chapter 5 verse 7 this is what it says over there if someone could read out that isaiah chapter 5 verse 7 Isaiah 5 7. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the and the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression. For righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. Yeah, so here it says, the vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel. And it goes on to say, the people of Judah are the grape wines that he delights in. So he was delighting in them and assuming that they would be bearing much fruit. But what comes out of them? He thought the fruit of justice will come out, but bloodshed came out of them. He thought the fruit of righteousness would, you know, they would yield that. But they instead gave way to cries of distress from the innocent people. So they, this, they, they, they proved to be a very fake wine. But Jesus says, I am the true wine. 
and so now the people who come and join themselves to me you know who are grafted into me they are the true israel so the true israel cannot live like the false israel of the past old testament this new israel which is being created through christ who are joined to him they need to behave like the true wine and they need to be correct representatives of christ so when it talks about this uh, you know um, the the branches all of us you know who are branches in him that we should bear fruit what kind of fruit is it talking about it's talking about us being true representatives of this jesus in our attitudes in our uh, thinking uh, in our deeds uh, the, the 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 things that we do so in all of this we are supposed to represent this jesus christ because he is the true vine and so the branches also should should resemble him the fruit which they bring out should resemble him so uh, in that sense he says as long as you are abide in me you will be able to bear fruit on the other hand if you are not drawing your strength and your grace from me you will not be able to live at this level because his standards are very high you know his his standards are divine standards you cannot live uh, at that level on your own you need his empowering and his grace to be able to produce christ like fruits those things cannot be produced on our own in our own human uh, strength uh, so therefore he says you know you have to abide in me that's the only way you will be able to bear fruit so in verse 2 he says every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away and every branch that bears fruit he prunes now uh, you know bruce wilkinson came up with an entire book uh, to talk about this verse and he says when it talks about branches which are not bearing fruit and he takes them away he says no 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 that word over there is not take away it's actually just to lift up from the ground i uh, you know the gardener will lift up that branch from the ground he'll clean it he'll try to restore it and he says a lot of nice things and uh, so the book became very very popular but then if you look at the you know the line of thought which jesus is conveying over there in verse 5 he goes on to talk about how these branches which are not bearing fruit what is done to them they are actually chopped off and they are thrown in the fire and they are burnt so he's actually talking about two separate categories of branches there are those which are not bearing any fruit you know they are, they are they are drawing up all the nutrition and the sap from the vine but they're not yielding anything on the other hand you have uh, these sincere branches which are drawing strength and sap from the main vine and they are giving something in return you know they are producing fruit which are worthy of the vine so the branches which are not bearing fruit he very plainly says in verse 5 that they will be taken away and they would be burnt so um it's my personal opinion that bruce wilkinson was wrong in whatever he said in his uh, book you know about how uh, none of the branches are ever taken away and we also have you know hebrews chapter 6 hebrews chapter 10 where there is a word of warning given to the people of god those who have uh, tasted of uh, of the uh, you know of, of the word of god those who have experienced the power of the holy spirit he says such people if they fall away you know there is only judgment waiting for them so there are words of warning given even in other places so i think it, it is talking it is uh, it is a kind of um, a warning that jesus is giving here that if we you know actually are considering ourselves his disciples then we better be his disciples we our attitudes and our uh, speech and our deeds must represent him if we are not living as his disciples then maybe we are really not disciples and so maybe you know we never really belonged in the vine at all so we would need to examine ourselves and make sure that we are true branches attached to the true vine you know just to be uh, careful so those which are bearing fruit he doesn't just leave them alone he prunes them 
and that word which is used over there for uh, the you know the word which is translated over there as prune um in the greek language that particular word can either be prune or it can be cleanse so maybe it's a little bit of both you know so uh, those of us who are bearing fruit he will continually cleanse us more and more he'll continually prune us more and more so that whatever is still remaining which is unfruitful will be cut away so that we can become more fruitful so that we can represent him even more accurately so for all of this to happen we need to continue abiding in the vine and that word which is used over there the, the, the tense you know uh, it, it's a continuous present tense it's not a one time thing where you say a salvation prayer and then you say okay now i become part of the family of god because i said the salvation prayer it's not that kind of an abiding that word abide is, is a continuous present tense where every day you again get up in the morning and make a choice to continue abiding in him because then the fruit comes you know if you just take a normal normal any plant you know the the branch walks away uh, for one week and then comes and reattaches itself for two hours and then you know something else comes along some other distraction and then the branch again you know detaches itself and walks off do you think it's ever going to bear any fruit i mean there has to be some continuity right before the fruit starts showing uh, so uh the branch continually needs to stay attached to the main trunk so in the same way we have to continually abide in him um to be able to start bearing fruit uh, where people will start recognizing that we are becoming more and more like him um so which is why he says without me you can do nothing it sounds almost like an overstatement how can it be that we can do nothing without him i mean there are people of other faiths other religions who are doing so much i mean there are charitable organizations you know which they have established which are doing so much good for so many people so yes there are many things that uh, many good things that you can do without god isn't it so how can jesus make a statement like this without me you can do nothing he is basically talking about deeds which will have eternal repercussions eternal benefits whatever people do without him is temporary the fruit of that will only be temporary to use one biblical example let's look at acts chapter 10 which talks about the story of cornelius we are talking about a very godly man and this man moreover you know he he had become a um he had become a what is the term that they use for them um, um you know he 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 did not become circumcised and become a jew uh, but he was a follower um follower of the way is the term which they use for jesus followers these people um, it's there in the nkjv and i don't have nkjv with me right now god fearers yes thank you yes so cornelius you know was most probably a god fearer uh, that's the term that's the label the formal uh, title which was given to the people who uh, did not become completely part of the jewish community you know they did not undergo circumcision and become part of the community but they believed in yahweh you know they trusted him so rather than worshiping all the other idols and all of that uh, they they began to express their loyalty to yahweh alone but they have not gone all the way and become circumcised so um, these are, these people were referred to as the god fearers cornelius belonged to this community most probably and we get to know that this is a man uh, about whom um, um, you know the angel gives a testimony about him and this is what the angel says about him acts 10 verses 30 to and 31 acts 10 30 and 31 please and cornelius said four days ago i was fasting until he saw this hour and at the ninth hour i prayed in my house and behold a man stood before me in bright clothing and said cornelius your prayer has been heard and your arms are remembered in the sight of god imagine it the angel says to him your arms are remembered 
uh, in the presence of god you know the the money that is been given to giving to the poor the 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 charity and mercy that he has been showing all that god has you know taken note of it god has recognized the good things that he has done but if cornelius had died in his sins he would have gone to hell so you see he did achieve good things he did uh, give money to the poor he did show charity he did all of these things but without jesus all of these good things would be nothing because when he goes and you know stands there on judgment day before god everything which is not of jesus will be burnt up and nothing will be left only ashes so in that sense in the eternal sense jesus is saying without me whatever you do in and through me through my enabling and you know with my blessing and my approval that will stand and that will have a reward one day all the other good things the lord will take note of it and so maybe in hell you know their punishment will be lighter they would not be judged as harshly as hitler would be judged but the sad thing is that ultimately it is nothing what you do apart from jesus eternally is nothing only what you do in and through him stands and will be and will one day have a reward so cornelius fate also would have been the same thing without jesus in spite of all his good works which have been noted in the eyes of god he would still have amounted to nothing if he had not accepted jesus as his lord and savior so to such people jesus says in verse 7 if you abide in me and my words abide in you you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you because these branches which have attached themselves to the true vine and they are abiding continually they are not walking away from him for one week and then coming back for two hours on sunday you know they're not doing that they're continually abiding in him and because they are doing that now their desires their ambitions have become synchronized with his ambitions his desires they are in sync with him their heart is in sync with his heart so now whatever they ask it will be in line with what he you know what he would approve of they would not ask for something which goes against his will so therefore whatever they ask it will automatically be answered because you know they have their priorities correct now so that assurance is given to them that such people those who are abiding in him they can ask what they desire because their desires will be synchronized with his desires they will not ask for something which is wrong and so he says it will be done for them he will give them what they desire um and uh, so then he goes on to talk about you know he tells them that they must remain in his love and he says a few things about love uh, so we will look at those uh, verses after we come back from the break thank you <laughs>